are listening to the Moody Girl podcast with me, Emily Fazer. Throughout this series, we're going to be opening the minds of experts and delving into the world of alternative healing methods. People pleasing is us responding to anxiety about something real or imagined. Plus, it's our response to tension and hoarded anger from our unprocessed hurts and losses. We think those feelings died or that we threw them out in the trash, but they're still there. Some feelings are so buried, we forgot we buried them and piled some more dirt on top. People-pleasing is like whack-a-mole, though, because it provides only temporary relief. Not feeling our feelings, aside from disrupting our emotional intelligence, also creates stress. We avoid our feelings to not deal with the stress of something not realizing that this avoidance is a stressor. And the suppressing and repressing of ourselves to please others means we ignore and distrust our wonderful bodies instead of listening to them. We comply to keep the peace, not realizing that there's no peace inside us. And because we've gotten so used to being this way, we think we're fine, not realizing we lost our sense of fine and our limits a long time ago. Wow. Thank you so much for reading that today, Natalie. Um, first of all, congratulations on the release of your book. I've been reading it all week. And honestly, I've resonated with so many different parts of it, um, whether it's January blues, whether it's, um, you know, me coming on my period this week. But I felt really emotional when reading parts of it because you were kind of, it felt like peeling back the layers of an onion. And like, yeah, I was just like, actually, I am a people pleaser and I didn't even realize it, you know, and from your book, I have really, really gone quite deep into that this week, every night before bed. And I've been like having quite nuts dreams and yeah, it's, it's been really, oh, wow. yeah, really eye opening. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you, Emily. That means a lot. Um, so I found out about your work through a mutual friend of ours called Shashi, who I actually met in Jamaica. Oh, wonderful Sashi I love him he were you on a retreat with him as well no so we were I was staying at an Airbnb in Treasure Beach oh, um, yeah, yeah. so we went there and we did a session of yoga with him and we just hit it off and I was just blown away with his energy his presence and his session itself and I was like I need to get this guy on the podcast he's in, he's incredible um yeah so he was telling me all about your work so I started looking into your socials um and then it just so happened that you had your book release um so that's why I reached out so yeah thank you so much for taking time to chat with me and and the moody girl audience today because this is something um that I think almost every single person in society has some some form of it in their life mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know so I mean did you always let's start from the beginning um you know you're an author now you've got a really amazing book out you've got a fantastic social media presence um you know you're doing a million different things um that are really positive and did you always want to do this, you know, line of work or how, how, how did you get to this point? This is a really great question, actually. Um, I have always been really creative. So as a, and not just creative, but I was an obsessive reader as a child. I actually don't remember ever being able not to read. I, I was reading from about three. Wow. Um, and so I absorbed myself in books and art um, as a child. That was my form of escape. And I guess it really is a way of protection as well. Um, I would write a lot as a kid. I was often called a nosy Parker. Mm. So for what seemed to adults as me being up in other people's business because I was observant or I asked questions. I was the kid who always knew who was having an affair or who was up to no good. Mm. And um, I was also treated like I was older than my years. So in a way, sometimes I was expected to be more mature than my parents or, or certain adults around me. 
and as a teenager, I was the one, and even when I went on into adulthood, I was the one that friends often came to for advice. Mm-hmm. There was a few friends, for, you know, I grew up in Dublin in Ireland and there's a few friends back home who were like, oh, I could see you being like a writer when you grow up, but a writer was you know, writer, anything creative. It's funny. It was, it, it was encouraged as in, oh, well, you're good at that. So you should do it to be the best but not as a career which sounds so paradoxical like you're encouraged to be the best at it but if you say that you want to go and study it it's like really yeah can't you be like a lawyer doctor Mm -hmm. engineer accountant you know something not just stable but that is seen as you know a sign of oh our child has done done well and they're prospering in the world and when when I was in when I was about 20, 22, 23, I'd spent a summer in, in Fort Lauderdale in the US. And um, I'd, so, I'd started to feel like I could go back to go back to university because I dropped out, I think, the second year of university after being made to do, um, what was it? An accountancy and human resource management degree. And I'd, I'd actually failed economics I'd never failed an exam in my life but I failed as well it hit hard but I also didn't want to do it so I dropped out and I went off and was kind of doing bits and pieces and then I started working in advertising and then I'd gone off and traveled and while I was away traveling I was like oh I could move to the U.S. very naive about how much it costs Mm. to do that and so I spent a semester at the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale Wow. That was in the autumn of 2001. I was there at the same time as uh, Venus and Serena Williams, who were studying wow. fashion design and merchandise there, I think it was at the time. Um, I, funny enough, had signed up to do what was called an online business degree or something like that. And I was walking past a classroom of students who were doing um I guess, illustration or graphic design. And I was like, sign me up right now, like a changed over. But in America, they make you do maths and English at at university. Yeah, they do. They had forgotten that I was technically an international student. So they made me do English. And so I turn up and she's like, right, nobody leaves here until you've written a 500 word essay based on this prompt she gave us a structure and I remember going into free fall because uh, that recover well now recovering perfectionist in me hates not knowing how to do something and sort of flame so I was like oh my gosh but I did it I got an A wow she said I love your writing style and I was like no because I'd always enjoyed writing but it was I'd never felt like it was sort of acknowledged that I had any sort of aptitude for it. And I probably, maybe I didn't actually at that point, but every week I went back and wrote essay after essay based on this prompt and built my confidence with it. And something ignited in me, Um, but realized it was too expensive, came back, went, uh, transferred into a university here in England, did, did a degree in product design came out of that, realized uh, to like, what am I going to do? Work for 10 grand a year at like 25, 26 years old, not happening. Yeah. Went back into working in advertising and started a blog. I was about a year into that. So that was June, 2004, because I'd seen an article in the Guardian um, in the April of that year. And it was about... I still have the piece that was talking about a blogger called Belle du Jour and just the emergence of blogging. And I cut out that article, put it to one side, went on a bad date in early June, 2004, was awake with a dodgy stomach from the meal that we'd had and suddenly remembered blogging. And it's this idea crystallized that I could talk about the feelings I was having about my woeful taste in men, mm-hmm. about how I said I wanted to be with a nice guy, but I was always never interested in those. And I was always interested in the unavailable ones. And so I started writing a blog called Tired of Men and Other Things That Drive a 20 something around the twist. And I was, uh, I guess I would have been 26, 27 at the time uh-huh. when um, when I started that. And that's how that's how I got into got into this never by the way saw myself being here 
now, like almost 19 years later. But yeah, that's how I got into it. I think that's really refreshing take on it as well, because I feel like a lot of, you know, myself included, but friends as well, um, you're expected to leave school and have that thing that you want to do. And, Mm. you know, that's a huge amount of pressure, whether it's, you know, from family or social pressure. And so, you know, people you you can usually have a few years of you know, stumbling around and and trying to figure it out. But then it's it's kind of mid twenties, beginning of thirties, where people are like, right, you know, you need to have your shit together now. You know, what are you doing? How are you kind of moving up the ladder, as they say? Have you got the car, the nice car parked in the drive? You know, have you moved on from the first home that you've got? And all of these layers start to build, and then all of a sudden you're just like, ah, you know, I haven't figured it out yet. And everyone, and and I feel that with a lot of my friends and and me still I'm figuring it out continuously trying to anyway um so I think it's refreshing how you say you know you did all of those different things and you know you went to Fort Lauderdale then you came back and you tried product design then advertising then started writing and it's <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's really good when you put it like that because this is real life you know it isn't yeah. we can't watch these Hollywood films where people, you know, finish school and they bump into someone and they get an internship with Vogue and it's the best job ever. And you just, you know, it's so many of these things that are apparently reality now really on and it can bring people down. So I think stories like yours are realistic um, and also really amazing because you found it from searching on your on your own path, essentially. Um, well, thank you, Emily, because, you know, I'm 45 I'll be 46 this year and it wasn't really the done thing to do what what I you know like dropping out of uni and working for for a few years and then going off and going back to uni and then being like okay this is too expensive move back home to Ireland okay I'll move to London now that I'm back and I'll do this, uh, okay, this is actually not really going to be very supporting in terms of an actual employment. So, okay, go and do this. And when I said that I was going to, you know, I'd, I'd had my first daughter, I'd been on maternity leave, I'd gone back to work for four days and realized, oh, they've lured me back with a promotion that for a job that doesn't really exist they just hadn't got their shit together and I was like I'm going back on maternity leave like let me know when you've kind of got yourself together and I picked up freelance work like that day and was like I could I could write like full-time I could write because at this point I had my website baggage reclaim and I was like I could I could have a go at writing this full-time and I could write an ebook and people thought I was crazy Mm. to when I said I am leaving this job to go and basically be a full-time blogger they were like your job is here when when you're when you're ready if it doesn't work out and I you know we had a colleague that um passed away about 10 years or so after I had left and so we gathered really probably for the first time actually since before we'd left and my old boss was like how are you doing and he goes you you know at any time, you know, your your job is here if you want it. And I said to him, you know, I've been gone over 10 years, yeah. <laughs> but it I, there was a lot of, it is exactly what you said. You're supposed to climb the ladder and you're supposed to tick the boxes of what is deemed to be successful. And also you're supposed to take advantage of all the opportunities that come your way, but also that maybe, for instance, your parents, or your grandparents, didn't get to have so there's all of these sort of layers to it and then you're seen as flaky and frivolous and or stupid or whatever it is you know these judgments because people can't see the road up ahead and your choices seem really scary Mm -hmm. to them and you can also like from I think from my parents' perspective, specifically my mom and my stepfather because that's who I grew up with I think at times they felt like I was squandering Mm. my education so it was it was tough at times yeah I can imagine that and I think I mean I my family just have described me as having itchy feet do you know what I mean one thing to the other to the other and 
as much as I always saw it as a bit detrimental, but I feel like I'm just, even just listening to you now, I feel a sense of relief hearing your story um, because I identify with it, definitely. Um, and so obviously let's go to more into people pleasing. Um, mm -hmm. So The Joy of Saying No, your amazing new book that's out. So, you know, how did you become so invested in learning to say no? So I think initially it was, I wouldn't say accidental, but more of a byproduct of the fact that after grappling with a serious immune system disease and, you know, being given quite a, a poor prognosis for it, I had made radical changes in terms of my health. So I was going to see an acupuncturist, well, actually I started with a kinesiologist first and then with acupuncture. And so there was sort of changes to my diet, but also a lot of emotional work that I was doing in this. Um, but there was a, I'd heard the word boundaries during that time. And look, I grew up like so many of us did at a time when those were just not terms that you ever heard, or well, they were certainly never expressed to you as, oh, these are good things for you to have. Like you weren't actively taught about having healthy boundaries and self-care and accessing your feelings and, uh, you know, self-esteem, we, we weren't actively taught about these. And so um, I was in that phase and as a byproduct of realizing that I had to, I had to take care of myself. That's how I stumbled into the boundaries piece and saying no and expressing limits because here I was battling with this disease that had been ravaging my body and I was now, you know, drinking far more water, you know, hydrating myself. I cut these things from my diet. I was doing this emotional work, but I realized, well, what is the point in all of that? If you walk out of this place or you go and do those things and then you go and hook up with your dodgy ex mm -hmm. from work or you don't draw your line with uh, a family member and you don't say stop or this is feeling really uncomfortable or this is who I am and this is what I'm about and so I remember a few days before I met my now husband I had broken it off with a guy that I'd been seeing for about three weeks he had recently qualified as a doctor and when I had come back from an appointment with the acupuncturist he had laughed me out of it and was like that is so pathetic. Don't you realize that your illness has no options and that you need to, you should be looking at your you know, medical, you should have taken that advice, you should be on steroids. And I remember thinking, who the flip does this guy think he is? I actually said to him, you've been a doctor for all of a wet freaking week and you actually think you have the right to tell me that I'm stupid. He actually called me stupid. And I said, you, you feel like you have the right to speak to me that way? I said, you don't. And I don't want to be around somebody who would speak to me that way. And there were little things that he had done in those few weeks that we had dated where I had known that it annoyed me or that it just wasn't a fit. And I'd, I'd had various friends be like, I really think you're quite picky. And I was like, no. And I remember ending it with him and he was like, oh. And then I got off the phone. I remember being really upset, not because I finished it with him, but I was still at that stage where asserting myself, standing up for myself could actually be quite unsettling. And I sort of burst into tears and it's like a grief that would sort of kick in. But I remember saying to myself, I would rather be single or not be, you know, in whatever relationship is supposed to last. I'd rather not be in that until if it's going to take until I'm in my thirties, forties, whatever it is, fine. I'd rather that was the case than spend another moment in a relationship that is just not for me, mm -hmm. like with somebody who's emotionally unavailable or who thinks they can, you know, talk me up and down, whatever. I said, I actually would rather be on my own. I like being on my own because I'd actually learned to enjoy that. And three days later, I met my now husband, but what I realized a few years into it was that a big piece in my journey was recognizing where I needed to, to speak up 
to be clearer about who I am. I think a lot of people see boundaries as telling people what to do. No, boundaries is just you showing up as you are, living by your values, Mm -hmm. taking care of your needs, expectations, desires, feelings, and opinions from a place of love, care, trust, and respect. And it was an unfolding journey of realizing you're still, you're not asking for help or you, your needs are not so clear here. And so different things came along that gradually, I think in 2014, when my mother-in-law lived with me for, well, us for eight and a half months, it finally, like I was aware, I talked about people pleasing already at that point, but it finally hit home for me about this really going far deeper with this people pleasing and this boundaries work. And that just really put a rocket under me at that point, because at that point I'd had a number of big experiences where I had had the boundaries and I had, for instance, said no, but I felt very sort of still a bit run over Mm. by, by the experience of it. And I was like, this is interesting work because you feel like you've done a lot of work, but there's always more stuff to do. So what is this all about? And that's how, I really stumbled into going far deeper with this people pleasing and boundaries work because of course I'm not the only person talking about this stuff but I knew that the perspective that I was sharing on it was different Mm -hmm. yeah I agree and I think there's also I and and talking to friends now and got friends who are going through breakups um you know we're mid-30s there's this pressure as well that as a woman, if you haven't found Mr. Right, then there's a huge alarm clock going on top of your head. And if you haven't found Mr. Right in time to have kids, then life is over. And men don't seem to have this stress. Women, you know, and it is that it's like, okay, should I continue? You know, there's a few red flags, but no, yeah, he's a nice guy in some ways. He takes me out for dinner. He'll pay for this. He'll pay for that. But oh, he's a bit mean behind closed doors. Maybe I'll let that slide. You know, there's all those sort of things going on on a daily basis, I think, especially for women of a certain age who are scared to say no because of those very reasons. Um, And I think you showing up that day just shows that the universe rewarded you for saying, actually, I'm not handling this. You get out of my life. And, you know, although you've had grief at letting that out, then mm. your husband walked into your life three days later. I mean, that is literally like something out of a film. That's insane. <laughs> well, the funny <laughs> thing was is that in the you know I had that I had the appointment about my illness that was like August uh, two thousand and five, and I'm I met my husband like literally at the end of a night like a, a charity event that we were at like literally five minutes before we were going. Well, I I noticed him earlier on in the evening. I thought, oh, who's that cute guy? <laughs> we spoke briefly, but didn't actually go speak to each other or go on a date until it was like March of of two thousand and six. What was interesting is that when I look back, there were a number of times between August and really February of that year where exes had popped up out of the woodworks men had approached me while I was out you know with friends or whatever um I I had dated a few people for and none of them had really lasted for any length like before I could have gone out you know met any of those guys and turned them into a one two year whatever relationship they were all done and dusted within like two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. And I had very firmly dropped the gauntlet on a couple of exes. And so it felt like at the time you don't see it, but then looking back, I'm like, (laughs) oh, universe, you're very funny. (laughs) Because it was, it threw me so much. Bearing in mind, I had to work with my ex. We shared some clients. Uh, he sat across the way from me. We briefly hooked up after I'd have been no contact with him for like the best part of a year. And immediately I was like, this is a mistake. You need to leave. We are done. Mm-hmm. Like it, I suddenly realized I am not this person anymore. You are not that woman. And then about a month or so later, another ex the one I've been seeing funny enough after the colleague had reached out and it's like oh I'm you know I'm up the road in a bar and I turned up and he had another girl there which okay fine I wasn't seeing him mm-hmm. but it was you know I, I talk about like fallback girls or fallback guys where these yeah it's like 
you're the person that an emotionally unavailable person falls back on, defaults to for a shag, a stroke, an ego stroke, you know, a shoulder to lean on. And so I realized very quickly what was going on, that he he was playing dumb about it, but that he clearly, this woman was interested in him and she had seen me and was just immediately triggered. And she was so nasty to mm. me that night. And she cut me off from the group. She tried to isolate me. His friends were mortified by the situation and they called him out on it at the time. And when I got back, I remember calling him and letting him have it. Mm -hmm. And I remember calling my friend and breaking down in tears going, what the hell is going on in my life at the moment? Like I just told him exactly how I felt about all of his behavior. And I said to him, I'm not going to allow you to play dumb about what is taking place tonight. You're like, oh, I don't know what's going on. You know exactly what is going on. And like, don't, don't call me, you know, mm -hmm. I'm done with yeah. you. So all of this, you know, I, I found messages from like other exes reaching out being like, hey, blanked. Mm -hmm. So, and the funny thing is my, my now husband had actually been sort of vaguely in my social circle. Wow. We, once we were going out, he, um, he was like, I feel like, I, I, I feel like, I've got a picture of you somewhere. So he went and put out this box and about two or three years before we had been both been at um, a, a friend of his, who's now a really good friend of mine, a birthday party, her 30th birthday. I had gone with another friend of his, our mutual friend who is the ex-girlfriend of his brother. What? And so I had known about her because when I'd met her, she had just broken up with his brother. She used to live with him at uni. So she lived with my now husband at uni. So there's this whole thing. And we had been at various different parties together. I'd even briefly, I'd gone on one date with like one of his friends as well, which was like very, very funny when we were talking about that. <laughs> so it was so funny. But there we, there it is, a photo of me with my friend. And he was like, how funny that I have a photo of the woman who like, would be my girlfriend. And then obviously I, we went on to have kids and married. But how funny that he had that photo of me from before we'd actually properly met, met. Wow. And you just obviously at that point, you were just surrounding yourself with the wrong people. So you weren't gravitated together at that point when you met your, well, that you were in the same room at the 30th birthday you were kind yeah. of with all these exes who were not right for you at the time mm. so it's obviously so interesting I love those types of stories I love it um so in your book obviously um we talk about people pleasing the art of saying no um but I mean as a society we've all been taught that saying yes or being a yes man I mean we've all seen the Jim Carrey film mm. um, opens up doors for everyone you know if you say yes god you're gonna have so many opportunities life's gonna be amazing take those opportunities <laughs> <laughs> but what you're saying is actually if we continue to just say yes to everything it's going to be detrimental to our health is that correct yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no discernment in saying yes to everything mm -hmm. because what we're doing is we're not saying yes with consideration of our needs, desires, expectations, feelings, and opinions. So we have consideration of our values and boundaries. On top of that, we're often saying yes without considering the meaning and consequences of doing so. So the impact of that. And also we say yes without even considering ourselves. So we don't go, what's my energy levels like? Or what's my schedule like today? What else have I got going on? What's coming up? So we will look at that moment or that hour or that day, but we won't necessarily look at what we've just done, what's coming up, leaving space for ourselves to rest, whether or not we actually want to do it. It's like, we just don't even consider that as a basic and this is toxic to our emotional mental physical and spiritual well-being and actually even our financial well-being mm -hmm. as well because if we're saying yes to everything then we're not saying no when we need want to and should and an inauthentic yes is very problematic because behind it there's resentment there's you know avoidance there is this sort of acting as if we don't have a choice 
in 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 things that's why i say if you don't say yes authentically you say it resentfully fearfully and avoidantly and that leads to more problems than if you just said no in the first place so when we when people say to me i'm burnt out or i just feel so low i'm hating myself i'm hating work relationships so the first thing you need to consider what do i need to start saying no to Mm -hmm. because that is why you are where you are at You've said yes to things that for all intents and purposes can seem like good things, but for the wrong reasons. It's why people fi- say, oh my God, I, f- I finally got my dream job and I've completely come apart at the seams. Like I've had a breakdown, I've had terrible anxiety, I've experienced burnout, I've been you know, a total confusion. And that's because sometimes getting what we think we want makes us realize uh, this totally is not what. I want. And then we feel like, oh, but I'm not allowed to say no now because I fought so hard for this. You know, you mentioned earlier on about women in our own personal ladder and, and, and the, you know, the, the alarm clock. So yeah, plenty of women maybe do want to be in a relationship in their thirties, for instance, and, they, and maybe they do want kids, but you know what? I've spoken to plenty of women who also admit that what happens it's almost like as soon as they cross into their 30s this anxiety starts to build about being coupled up and about where they are in their career do i own a house you know have i done all the things and oh having kids so people who don't even want to have children start thinking oh my gosh my biological clock is ticking (laughs) i'm running out of time so it's programming and me, I'd had, I had my daughters uh, at 29, just before I was 30 and at 31, I think 31, 32. When I was 38, I remember going for an appointment to have, you know, I had one of those coil, you know, the five-year coil things. Yeah. I just felt like I had this foreign object in my body. Something was a bit off, you know, you just follow your intuition. I was like, I want this thing out. The amount of questions I had from this woman, well, what are you having an out for? Are you planning to have with the kids? Well, when you think of the age you are, you know, bad things can happen, you know, just liable for more problems, you know, at this stage. I said, mate, I've just come to get the coil out. You yeah. never came for, <laughs> for all of this. So, but what was interesting is even though I, you know, ha- hadn't been thinking about really having kids and, you know, we had, we had two, two, 22 and a half months apart. For a few years, I was going, I, well, not a few years, but sort of on and off for a few years, I was like, do I want kids? Do I not want kids? But I realized it was programming. It was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be thinking about because I'm a late 30 something woman. And then I got into my early forties and I remember myself, my husband, we were in Amsterdam and we were um, just out having drinks just on our own. And then um, we just got into this conversation. We realized that we had, if we had been interested in having a third, we had long missed that window different things had come along but also neither one of us had wanted it that badly mm-hmm. so it wasn't like we either one of us were like no but also neither one of us but yes and so we were okay to be fine about it but I realized like oh my gosh how are we programmed into this anxiety like you t- I felt like I crashed and burned as I approached 40 because you're programmed to think oh my gosh it's the end of the world that I'm turning 40 <laughs> so it's just women we have less margin to say no and we've just had so much put on us about who we are supposed to be it's like we exist for the consumption of everybody else and the thing is you do the stuff and it's never enough you meet somebody when you're getting engaged you get engaged but when you're getting married when yeah. you're moving in when you're having kids you've had a kid when you're having another one oh my god you've had the other one oh you're not going to have any more kids are you like leave me be (laughs) yes oh my god that's so good yeah and I think I've I've got a friend who just had a baby actually and she was just like people are already asking me if I'm having thinking about another one she's like it's only six months I'm just I've just only gotten over the actual giving birth part give me a break (laughs) it's 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 relentless and you're just like and then, and then, then they want to know what you're doing with the kids. You're not going. You're not going to send them to private school. Or you are going to send them to private school. Or <laughs> you're not going to be doing this. You're not leave me alone. And then it's also, oh, 
you've lost a lot of weight or Ooh, you've gained a lot of weight. Are you oh. pregnant? Get off yeah. my case. Yeah. Just don't even talk about my image whatsoever. Don't start the conversation with how I look. Don't start, don't start with what I'm wearing. Yes. Just, just ask how I am. How are you? That's yeah. enough. That's more than enough. <laughs> it's so exhausting. And I and I've just found that as time has gone on, I just object to it, you know. And when, for instance, in, in black culture, when you're around the elders, they comment on your hair or your bum. Or, you know, it's like, oh, well, why are you dressed like that? That looks ridiculous. And how can we not wear something fancy if you come around to see your elders? I'm a 40-something year old woman. Like I'm thinking to myself as I'm doing my hair, oh, I'm gonna do it this way for my relatives like it's exhausting <laughs> relatives should be the one you can relax around like you know it's hard enough getting dressed and going out to meetings and you know putting the face on each week um so there was a question I really wanted to ask you so in the book which I thought was really really interesting and I love the way that you did this so there's five different types of people pleasing mm -hmm. and so I loved how you did like a little story almost about you know these people pleasers, pleasers. Um, so can you briefly tell us as an audience, what are those five types um, mm -hmm. and a few characteristics of those types as well to see if anyone can identify with those um, characteristics? Yeah, so the five styles of people pleasing are gooding, efforting, avoiding, saving and suffering. And the names in and of themselves imply what, that people please are tends to focus on. So people who have that gooding style or you know, somebody who you could say is a gooder, they are about being good, looking good. They want to be liked by others and actually they're gonna have the most anxiety about not being liked. Like, why don't they like me? Mm. Even if they don't like the other person, it's like, but why don't they like me? And they will be concerned about being a good girl, a good guy, a good Christian, a good person, a good employee, whatever it is. Sometimes with that style as well, it's more about intentions and looking good, ne not necessarily about actually following through on that. Efforting, which is my you know, dominant style, is, as the name suggests, about effort. Being the best, uh, trying the hardest, giving 100%, perfectionism, the, the most likely to burn out mm -hmm. because it's not enough for them to give the impression of, of being good. Everything is about effort. So they will try to prove it in what they do. They, they've either already worked out that this is how they get praise and all the good things in life because when they perform, they get results or they're trying to prove or make up for something by always putting in effort. It's like trying all the time. It's not just trying, like making an effort. It's trying because of an underlying feeling of low self-worth, but also because they're trying to control everything. Avoiding, that style is about, I can please others by avoiding anything that I think will make them very uncomfortable. So a lot of conflict avoidance. It's, oh, what do you want to do, honey? I like what you like. I want to do what you want to do. <laughs> and so going along to get along to the extreme. All people pleasers do that to, to an extent and telling people what they want to hear. But somebody whose primary thing is about, I'm just going to avoid any form of discomfort whatsoever. That is where they will be. Saving is for the, the fixers, helpers, saviors of this world. You're the ones who always come to the rescue. Um, they have gooding and efforting inclinations, but they, for them, they have to, be seen to be helping and rescuing or the one who always volunteers. And so they need to be needed. There's something in them that has, has to be kind of working on a pet project, has to have somebody sort of in need because that's where they sort of light up and feel like, oh, I'm, I'm worthy, I'm purposeful. And then suffering is, it's like believing that a sign of a good person is somebody who suffers. So the more you suffer, the better you are as a person. I bleed for you type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so somebody who has that suffering style thinks that the way to please others is, for instance, to be the scapegoat, to, to be the, the black sheep, the target. And it, um, so what can happen there is somebody who has that suffering style, maybe was one of the others before, 
but they've sort of fallen on their sword really at this point and they will be in relationships for instance and they think that the way to love their partner is to not have any boundaries and so it's like I've busted up my boundaries look how much I love you or I've busted up my boundaries you should reward me with a relationship or you should finally change your ways because look how much I have suffered for you Mm -hmm. wow yeah I thought it was so interesting reading all of those when I was reading it I was trying to like find my own one and is it possible that you can like identify with different parts of a couple of them Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. that's what I found I found like Gooding is definitely where I related to but the story in terms of like the colleagues where she just like went and chucked them under the bus basically I feel like that wouldn't be something in my characteristic to do um Mm -hmm but I do have a huge level of anxiety on being liked um, on, and I'm quite comfortable with saying no. I will mm. often, if I get invited to stuff, I'm more than happy to say no. Um, but for me, it's about trying to blend in. So if I'm in, I'm in a situation or a group of people that aren't necessarily who share the same values as myself, um, to make my life easier sometimes I will just try and go under the radar rather than Mm -hmm. trying to be you know the quirky one all the time or someone who thinks a little bit differently or you know I'm labeled quite often as being the quirky one I got a job when I was in Australia because I had like a lego man earring and like all the other girls are really you know beautiful and he was my boss was like you know I we employed you because you're the quirky English one and I was like okay (laughs) I was 19 you know I was impressionable and and at the time I thought that was a compliment and then only years later I'm like god that was a really shady and nasty thing to say mm. um and you know I've been labeled throughout life as just someone who thinks a little bit differently and um so yeah so I felt like I did identify with gooding but then also um when you say the savior and um, the saving one um I relate to that as well because similar to you um, with your friends, I love giving advice. You know, I I get something out of helping people. Um, Mm -hmm. So I related to both of those. If we could kind of merge them together, I felt like that would be, yeah. Absolutely. Some people have it like I am, I'm like my dominant one would be efforting, but I have definitely dabbled in the others. And I would say I'm gooding, uh, gooding like dashes of gooding and avoiding and they're like I can be very like oh that's good girl mm-hmm. it took a and that's not so dominant anymore I think I've like effort in my family effort is what the name of of, of the game is <laughs> so I I and, and I also think and I mentioned this in the book that I think when also you come from that sort of uh what what some might call the immigrant experience, the immigrant background, that you are also more likely to lean into efforting or into gooding because of that pressure to assimilate mm-hmm. into and prove yourself as having been worthy of being allowed into the place wow. where you are. But I think that people, I think people can shift through them, but there tends that it's looking at what drives you, mm-hmm. what preoccupies you the most. Me, it'll be effort when I look back at the thread of the themes and my effort 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 because then I'm like but I tried so hard why mm-hmm. whereas somebody else is like but I've been so good or I've been so nice or why don't they like me and that's where you know where the gooding comes in and it's like but I avoided bringing that thing up well then you know what yeah. you think so I've given so much I've helped so much so this is, so- you're talking about giving Mm. and and helping and supporting you know you're in that sort of saving Mm -hmm. and then when you're like well how much more does he not realize you know what I have been through you already know you're in that sort of suffering zone there so it's noticing the themes of that that thread in your life and there might be more than one Mm -hmm. well but it's also noticing what that core theme is because then you'll know where you are likely to trip yourself up like I know efforts is where I have to pay attention to where I'm trying just that bit too hard, where I'm giving 100%, where I'm perfecting things, because that's where some form of people pleasing is showing up for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing. Noted. Um, So for anyone listening, they're probably now, you know, realizing that they either identify with with some of those characteristics. um, And 
what the questions they might be asking at home and which I was asking throughout the book is and, and I got further on and, and you go into it but for anyone who hasn't got your book um I know you mentioned there's six steps uh to stop people pleasing can you talk us briefly through that so you know people at home after this can think okay I'm going to start doing that yeah so the six steps are get to know your pleaser which is really look we all have crossover with what we might concern ourselves about or, you know, we're people pleasing or what we do, but we, it, our people pleasing manifests in our particular way in our life. So that first step is really about observing how you spend your yes, no's and maybes, and then experimenting with cutting back on your yes. Then it is, uh, you know, the second one is about recognizing your baggage. And look, it's not that people don't get on our nerves and piss us off and all the rest, but what we have to pay attention to is how we respond in certain situations. Like, you know, in situations where we're avoiding saying no or where we feel frustrated, but we're not necessarily, you know, speaking up about it. What's the baggage behind that? It's, It's like, yes, you may well have a valid concern. That person might well be getting on your nerves, taking advantage, whatever it is. But where else have you felt, thought and acted similarly to how you are in this situation? Because that gives you a clue about why you are, for instance, avoiding saying no in this situation. The next step then is about reparenting yourself. And that is because people pleasing is a strategy, you know, a maladaptive strategy that we learned in childhood. So when I say maladaptive, what I mean by that is that uh, yeah, it helped us to cope and survive in childhood, but now that we're an adult, it, it becomes increasingly ineffective. And that's why it can be very confusing for people, please, as whether like, but this used to work. Why doesn't it work now? And it never really did work, work, but it, it got, it helped us get by. And so it's really connecting with those younger parts of us that are crying out for our support and, and our attention And it's getting into a healthier dialogue with ourselves so that we can recognize that our people pleasing is basically anxiety presenting itself in our lives. And then the way that we respond to it is a very messy way of trying to manage our anxiety. You know, it's that, am I being light? You know, am I going to get into trouble? So that reparenting yourself is you stepping in and being like, oh, actually, I am my primary caregiver now. And then the next one is to make it a desire or say no. And so that is really noticing the difference between uh, desire. So do you actually want to do it or what, you know, what you want to do versus what you feel obliged to do? And when people really tap into this, they can start to recognize their why, as well as the feelings and thoughts that come up for them in their lives when they're presented with situations where they could potentially say no. And it is the why that makes what we do people pleasing because other people help out, you know, or, you know, do something for a loved one or stay behind at work a bit longer, but they don't do it because they're trying to cover up feelings of low self-worth. They don't do it because they're afraid of what would happen if they didn't do it. And that's what makes it people pleasing. So it's recognizing the why and starting to 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 be more in line with what we want versus what we feel obliged to do because obligation always 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 leads to resentment and tension and friction then there's cutting back on hinting because people pleasing is like one big ass hint you know it's like oh i'm doing this thing but i'm hoping that you figure out that i don't want you to talk about that thing or i hope you think okay i'll make sure i never criticize you or it's like reward me uh, and 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 it's also like it's so like what we're doing is we're going I can see what you're doing and I don't like it so I'm going to model being really pleasing and good and hopefully you're going to feel so guilty eventually that you're going to change your behavior we need to cut back on this hinting so that we can make way for more intimate relationships and then the final step is to learn from eruptions and challenges because we are going to experience what I call life's inevitables, conflict, criticism, stress, disappointments, loss, and rejection. And we often feel, and understandably so, beaten up by these things. But actually, when we realize 
that these are here to awaken us to ourselves and to help us up level our boundaries, to figure out what we need to say no to so that we can say yes to more of what we need, desire and deserve. We can actually capitalize on the these difficulties. And the great thing about these is look, all do all six, fantastic, but do one and they will inevitably lead to the others. Mm -hmm. And so and and, because that's what I I didn't want people to feel like, well, I have to do all six or I'm I I don't get to no, if you do one, you'll find your way into saying no in a more well, yes and no in more boundary ways. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, and before we go into asking the social media audience, because one, one last question for you, mm-hmm. I know on paper, you know, people may be saying, okay, fine, we can talk about saying no, but actually putting it into practice, <laughs> someone goes into the office on Monday, they listen to this podcast and their boss asks them to do something. They're generally not that happy at work anyway. Boss asks them to do something they really don't want to do. They say no. Um they get there's repercussions behind that what would your advice be you know how do we actually action this in a real life situation so the, realistically i know that and you know i've been guilty of that in the past you know where you kind of feel invigorated by something and so you almost think like oh i've listened to this thing or i've read this thing i've had this realization i'm gonna leap out of bed tomorrow morning and be like thank you lord i am healed and then you charge into work or wherever and you just spray <laughs> out all of those no's and then you're like <laughs> oh my god what the hell am i doing that's actually part of the reason why i encourage people to do that first step of getting to know your pleaser because you get a a, a, a bigger picture of where people pleasing is showing up and where you can start to take small steps like a lot of people charge in and sometimes you don't have any choice because it just happens to be that it's a big thing that presents itself next and it's just impossible to 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 say yes without creating a whole load of stuff but you don't have to charge in there with a big thing and actually it can be that in that moment so let's say for instance you go into work on monday and your boss turns around and asks you to do something that you actually don't want to do so first of all let's recognize well why is it that you don't want to do it Mm-hmm. Now, that why might be because actually you already have a lot of stuff on your plate mm-hmm. and you've already been saying yes to this stuff and to other things that are also not really supposed to be on your plate. So actually you don't have the bandwidth to say to, to say yes to this. It could be that it's actually not in your wheelhouse. It's somebody else's thing to do. It's maybe going to require you to stay, you know, after work or to put it, get to the, what, like, because if we say, I don't want to, what can happen is we start to feel like we're a bit childish mm-hmm. about, um, about our wants and needs. Acknowledge why that might be. And then because it's easier then to communicate. So rather than talking about no, because first of all, how are we going to communicate like that at work? <laughs> right. So then it's like, actually, Right now, this is what I currently have on my plate. If I'm going to be doing this, then I'm going to need to drop that or we're going to need to push the deadlines on that. So then you can have a more constructive conversation. It's like, actually, I can't do that, but I think that suggesting somebody else for it can also be that. So, and, and then sometimes it's like, actually, I'm not able to take that on right now. And that can be a really hard thing for us to do at work because we feel like that makes us a bad employee. Mm -hmm. However, do you know how many people I have spoken to over the years who have thought that saying yes all the time at work is a good thing and they get into appraisals and it is exactly the thing that is stopping them from getting a promotion. They are not seen as having good leadership skills, communication skills, um, assertiveness, because there is a clear pattern of in this situation, there was this issue, you didn't say anything about it. Or you're sitting here and you're now telling me that you felt overloaded, that there was too much stuff to do, but at no point did you even attempt to communicate that. And do you know what? There's also a fair argument to say, well, hold on a second. You're the boss. You know what you're throwing in my direction. So, but 
but there is a responsibility on both sides of of the boundary in communicating where it where it's over where you're overloaded and of course there are bosses that are exploitative but if you also haven't said anything it digs you into an even greater hole than if you actually had said something in the first place mm-hmm. i think that's amazing advice um okay so i'm we're on time so i probably won't be able to get through all of these sorry audience so i've got a few here okay um so let's start with this one i find it super easy to set boundaries with my close friends as i feel there's never any judgment we respect each other's decisions 100 percent. however when it comes to interacting with new friends work colleagues and acquaintances i find it really difficult to say no or to voice my real thoughts why is this and what's the best way to navigate setting boundaries with new people without coming across as rude or disrespectful so with the the close friends, for instance, there is, I guess, a sense of trust and intimacy in those relationships. For, on, on some level, you have these associations where these people feel safe. So it's almost like, actually, you're the low hanging fruit. It's almost easier to say no to you because we cool, we're close. With the other people, it's like your your fight flight response is kicked in and is going danger, danger, new equals possibility of rejection, conflict, criticism, disappointment. It's interesting though, because for somebody to have become a close friend, they had to have been a new friend at some point. So what I'm curious about is, If you're setting up your new relationships based on avoiding no, how is it that when you are now close friends with these people that you suddenly feel like, oh, I could turn around and say no and and have boundaries with those people? Because that the foundation is somewhat rocky rocky there. Now, it may be that these friends are so long standing and around for such a long time that you it may well be that you just happen to know each other very well and you're super close. But when you think about these new relationships, it's about starting as you mean to go on. And boundaries are a form of intimacy and trust. And so there has to be a sense of trusting yourself in these situations and recognizing that if you keep being dishonest with these people, which is what's actually happening, that you're setting yourself up for a fall because you're never going to be able to feel comfortable with them because now it's like, oh, well, I've just spent however many months or however long, like avoiding that. And now I need to turn around and and I have no choice but to say, it's gonna feel terrifying. So it's looking at what do you associate with new relationships that is different from existing ones. And if you can see what those differences are, like literally write it out on a piece of paper, you will spot where there's a bit of a blind spot. Um, and an anxiety about new relationships. And it's like, actually, what can I bring from my existing close relationships into new interactions that would help me to make it, help me to feel a bit more safe and secure about expressing who I really am? Perfect, thank you. Um, and then I will say there's, there's a short one here. Um, mm-hmm. What's the best way of saying maybe to give yourself more time to consider the pros and cons of saying yes? Six magic words, let me get back to you. Mm-hmm. And I encourage anybody who has an almost uh, almost reflexively says yes to make a, 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 an agreement with themselves, a contract with themselves that they will not say yes until they have basically given themselves space to get a sense of how they feel, what their bandwidth is, what, you know, what, what commitments they already have. Let me get back to you. And if they turn around and say, oh, no, I need an answer from you now, then the answer is no. Because if the person does not want to give you the option of giving yourself time to think about it, and you need, understandably, time to think about it and to consider yourself, then the answer is no. Perfect. But let me get back to you is a really good maybe, because then you you can genuinely check in with yourself. Mm -hmm. And final, final one now. If everyone on the world wasn't a people pleaser, would it actually be a good place to live? Uh, yes. I. One of the things I've been saying for a long time now is that if everyone was just even a little bit more boundaries, 
we would live in an entirely different world. And like our whole, uh, all the, most problems can trace their way back to boundary issues. I mean, actually really all problems can, boundary issues. And I mean, when you think about, for instance, all this stuff that's kicking off, you know, with Prince Harry. Mm-hmm. I mean, take out all of that stuff, because I'm not really particularly interested in Harry and Meghan, or the worlds for that matter, but actually it's a story of, oh my God, you've said no, this is wrong. And it's a story of who's allowed to say no and who isn't, who's allowed to have boundaries and who isn't. Like boundaries almost being like a status thing. Mm-hmm. And society feeling very uncomfortable with somebody talking about things that we have previously kept on the quiet. And that's why our mental health, we're in a mental health crisis, a loneliness crisis, you know, suicide rates are up. So many things because we don't talk about anything and and we block ourselves from having boundaries. So yes, the world would be such a better place if we all even had a little bit more boundaries. Brilliant. Well, I hope that was really helpful for the audience who asked those questions. Um, Thank you so much for your time. I feel like I've learned so, so much from you and your your speeches today and everything that you've gone into. I feel like I just want to go away and, and listen to it again to kind of make note of it. So thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Emily. It was a lovely conversation. Well, brilliant. Um, take care, Natalie, and I look forward to releasing the podcast. <laughs>